for Relax, It's Just Cat Grooming. I'm Lynn, your host and instructor with the National Cat Groomers Institute. This is the show where we answer your burning questions about grooming cats and running a successful business doing it. In today's episode, I'll be discussing three questions that we get asked all the time. What do I do about a negative review? How can I reduce stress during a grooming appointment? And what do I do if the cat hates the blow dryer? If you enjoyed today's quick chat, then make sure to click the notifications button on the National Cat Groomers page so that you can get notified when we post new videos and content just like this. So let's get started. It's happened. You've gotten a one-star review that is jacking up your awesome five-star rating. What do you do? Can you get Facebook or Yelp or Google to take it down? Who do I call? What do I do about negative reviews? Well, first, is that I want you to breathe. Just breathe, it is going to be okay. One negative review in an overall positive online appearance is not the end of the world. And I hate to bring it to you, but Facebook, Google, and Yelp do not really care if it's a fake review or if it's an upset review because they're not going to take it down. So we have to figure out what is it that we're gonna do about it. There are a few things that I want you to keep in mind when responding to a negative review. One, the response that you write is more important than the negative review. So aim to almost talk to the dozens, if not hundreds of potential clients who will be reading this. If your rough draft of a response looks more like, oh yeah, I showed them, then you need to reevaluate your goals of responding to this review because that is not the purpose. Two, a negative review is, um, a negative customer review is an opportunity to improve that client's experience with your business. I know it sounds crazy, but think about it. Would you rather someone alert you to a problem in your communication, in your process, in your follow-up with your staff, et cetera, or for them to just never return to your business without saying anything, because that's typically what people do. A review of any kind is a great way to get and digest feedback about your business. It would be awesome if every piece of client feedback is a rave review of your wonderful services, but unfortunately the nature of the beast is that people will overwhelmingly talk more about a negative experience than they had about a positive one. And the thing that they talk about the least, a neutral experience. Oh, it was just okay. I don't know about you, but I'd like my customers to feel more than just, oh yeah, it was okay, when they work with me. So use this negative review to step back and try to figure out where any potential gaps in your customer experience was. Look at your business objectively to see if there are any tweaks or changes that you could make to make sure a future client doesn't encounter the same things. Three, all right the actual review. First, I wanna reiterate what I said before is that your response should not be like, oh yeah, I showed them. Like I'm trying to one up them. That's not, no, no, no. That is not productive in business and it certainly isn't going to look favorably to this client, to any potential client that reads it or to any potential client that the unhappy client tells about it. No, we need to do some damage control. You need to acknowledge what the client is feeling offer an apology that they had a negative experience in your business and what you're going to do to resolve the situation. Now, this doesn't mean that you have to go in depth in your review response with what exactly you're going to do with this client. So for example, if you're gonna give them a refund, if you're gonna to offer to have them come back so you can fix it, so only you, the owner, are gonna do it, whatever it is, you don't have to go in depth in the actual response. It could really just be, you know, that you're acknowledging how they're feeling. You are addressing the fact that they had a negative experience in your business and that is not how you want your customers to feel and then give them a direct way to reach out to you um, or to the business owner or to the manager. But you want to improve this client's experience. That's the goal. Okay. So remember you think about, we do want to acknowledge, you know, we want to focus on what other people are going to be reading as far as this, but you also want to improve the experience for that client. Okay, so that's, we have to go hand in hand. Number four, don't make it too wordy. A long drawn out, he said, she said, review response does not look professional. Um, it looks like a lecture. You have to show concern for the pet 
but also a willingness to provide a resolution for the client. Okay. Five, finally, don't go scorched earth. I've seen some reviews that just blow it up and make a mountain out of a molehill. You want to keep it calm, professional, and solution oriented. And one last thing I'll add is to make sure that, that you review your policies and procedures to see if there are ways that you can improve client communications and give clients an opportunity to provide you with feedback before they go right for the negative review. A lot of times, if you look at negative reviews um, in other businesses, it doesn't have to be your own, doesn't have to be your own industry, the majority of time it's usually a miscommunication or that the client had unreasonable expectations or that they just had no expectations. And so that's really where communication comes into play. Um, I would also encourage you to look at negative reviews from other businesses. It can be your competitors. It can be businesses in other areas that are similar to your own. And keep in mind what people are reviewing negatively about these businesses that have a similar clientele to what you want and make sure that your business takes care of those kind of problems. So it's almost like you wanna see those problems, turn it around into a positive that you can promote on your business page or that you can talk about on your website. You know, if someone is saying that they, um, you know, if a similar business to yours is saying that they didn't like the fact that their pet was there for five hours and that they didn't get a call, that they had to like hunt them down, well then make sure that you cover on your page exactly how you set up expectations for each appointment, that you follow up, that, you know, they should expect your call at this time, that, you know, if they have any questions, they can call you. Or on the flip side, if it's that, you know, we turn off our phones, we lock the doors when we're grooming pets because we don't want any interruptions while we take our time with your individual pet. So it's about setting those expectations. And remember that every single grooming business operates differently. So if a client has gone to another business, they may just assume that your business works the same way. And I guarantee you it probably doesn't. So you have to be really clear on what it is that they should expect during a business appointment with you during an appointment with your business. And I think the best way to do that is to have a little video on your website of what the client should expect um, of an appointment. Basically like, you know, what your pet should expect at a day at, you know, happy dog salon. And you show a little video of, you know, that they come in, you know, oh, the little time in the corner is like, oh, our appointment time is 9 a.m. I'm here at 9 a.m. and my groomer is ready to go and it's showing you and happy and you're clean and professional. And then, you know, the pet walks in and, and you do an assessment. You talk about that you do an assessment, you know, first time appointments, plan for 10 minutes to fill out paperwork and talk about your pet's needs. And then it kind of goes, shows little happy you know, grooming things of, you know, approximately how long it takes and what happens during the groom and what's included. And then when they come to pick up that you go over them, whatever it is, a cool little video that's like three or four minutes, clients will gobble that up and it will help you to show them exactly why they should come to your business and then what they should expect when they actually have an appointment. Okay. So the next question, so I'm going to move on to how to reduce stress during a cat's grooming appointment. Since this is a cat grooming page, we're gonna talk about cat grooming right now. Um, so let's talk about some ways that you can reduce the stress for both you and the cat during their grooming appointment. First of all, you should limit additional noises, smells, and sudden movements as much as possible. If you groom dogs as well, then you should try to have a cat-only time or cat-only days where you won't have barking dogs around the cats because really they do so much better in a quiet, calm environment. I am a cat only groomer. This is my cat only grooming salon. And I regularly get cats from other dog groomers in my area because they just do so much better in my facility. Um, I don't try to do appointments back to back if they've had a negative experience elsewhere. So I've literally had people who called me from a dog grooming salon and say, I'm on my way. I said, like, no, we're not, no, no, no. Even if I had an appointment, we wouldn't do that. Um, because I want to make sure I'm separating the negative experience that they had at this other grooming salon. So mine is just quieter, it's calmer, there's no barking dogs, nothing like that. And trust me, cats will do so much better. If you have a busy salon, try to have limited cat appointments um, and really funnel them into a, like say one afternoon a month or one day a month, or maybe it's every Friday. You know, 
make it so that you have these cat only times and the cats will do so much better. Next, you'll need to get as much information as you can about the cat before they book their grooming appointment. Um, if I know that a cat is more likely to be shy or nervous or they were a former rescue or they're not used to being handled, um, I'll take extra steps during their appointment to make sure that they're more comfortable and I give them opportunities to hide or cuddle up. If you want more information about that, it's we talk about it in our complete cat groomer training syllabus, a little sales pitch right here. Um, we talk about temperament types and what they all the temperament types and what they like and what they don't like during the grooming appointment and how you can adjust your appointments. So all of our information, just check out nationalcatgroomers.com and it will give you everything you need to know. So, but you will need to adapt each appointment for that cat. Um, next is I like to do new cats as the first thing. Um, I do not like them sitting around and waiting. A lot of cats don't like that, especially if they're listening to new and possibly scary sounds um, before it's their turn. So I don't want to piss them off before I've ever gotten them out of the carrier. So I'll schedule new cats as the first ones of the day. They get done first, and I'll also put them on a quieter day so that I can just focus on their reactions without adding to, an, like, to how uncomfortable they are in a new environment. Um, a big thing with me that I work on is what I consider a priority system with challenging cats. This means that I take care of immediate problems first, which what is causing discomfort right now, matting, ingrown or sharp nails, gross rear ends, you know, whatever it is, I want to take care of it as the first thing. Then my goal after that is to get them clean, dried, and combed out because obviously that is part of relieving them from these problems. Then if the cat is still doing well, I'll start adding in um, services that will help prevent problems in the future. So this could be a D-shed, a comb cut, um, you know, maybe taking the belly up higher for a belly shave, you know, neatening up things. Um, and finally, at the very bottom of my priority totem pole are any vanity requests that the owner has. So toe tufts or, you know, neatening up around the head or, you know, something like that. Um, those are all vanity and I don't consider them to be high on my priority list. So I only add them in if the cat is still doing well from the appointment. Now, this doesn't mean that the cat can never get those services, but for the first appointment, I really work on a priority system and then I know how they respond to different things and I can make different recommendations once the client picks up. And sometimes I find that a cat who gets on an every, say, six week grooming schedule improves with each appointment. So then I can add additional services down the road. So I have a client, his name is Spartacus. I know for the people who came to the workshop that I did with Gracie Owen um, in the summer of 2019, I had this cat Spartacus as one of my demonstration cats. And when he first came to me, he was highly aggressive. He was very, very matted. Um, he hated everything about the grooming process. He was not, he was not a fun, he was very challenging. He's this big, big Maine Coon type of cat. And so we had to do a modified line cut and we had to get him on a bath schedule because he was not going to tolerate any type of shaving or hair cutting in the future. Well, now that I do him, he gets comb cuts. He gets a belly shave or sani. He just lays there. He thinks the grooming process is fine now because it's not such a big deal. He's also not in pain anymore. So we're not adding to that when we're actually grooming. So I can make adjustments as I go, but it really is looking at that priority system is the first thing I do. And I always want to make sure that I talk about that to my clients that I work on this priority system. This is my goal. I will focus on the problems that you're having first, and then we'll kind of build from there. Um, yes, because my overall thing is that I want to have a very positive long-term relationship with their cat. And that means working with them through the appointments. Okay. So those are my tips for reducing your cat's stress during a grooming appointment. I don't really go into a whole lot of um, supplements and sedatives and things like that because I work by myself and I prefer the cat to actually acclimate to the grooming process instead of having everything muffled. There will be a handful of cats that I will send to their vet for something like gabapentin, um, amitriptyline, something along those lines where it's more of a kind of calm them down mentally. That's normally for adult cats who have um, who are very difficult to handle even at home. Like they're formerly an outdoor cat or they're trying to maul me. 
you know, things like that, it's not so good. So we'll do a couple appointments on gabapentin. And if I see some improvement, I might recommend that we try without to just see if we've gotten past a point that we need it. Um, but it's a very small percentage of my clientele that's on gabapentin. And I don't like that to be something I go to right away. Um, and obviously I'm not administering ever, anything because I'm a groomer. I'm not a vet. I don't work at a vet and I will defer to their vet for any specific dosages or medications, anything like that, because I don't want the liability. So that's my little blurb on that. So the third question is, and I think this kind of goes along with that other question is about, um, about reducing stress is what if the cat hates the blow dryer? Now I blow dry every cat. So I'm going to go over some tips on how you can improve your cat blow drying process. Um, because a clean, beautiful, de-shedded and fluffed out cat really needs a blow dryer. Yeah, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take you way longer if you are using a stand dryer or a human hair dryer than it is to just use a blow dryer. And I get my cats used to using a blow dryer. So if I can do it, I know you guys can do it. First, you're going to use some big fluffy towels to absorb as much heavy water as possible. So this will reduce how long you'll actually need to be in the blow dryer. Next, choose your blow dryer well. I use a variable speed um, nozzle, I'm sorry, knob on my canine mini fluffer. So it's dark, but it's back there. Um, that way I can start at a lower pressure and then build up and increase with the cat's tolerance. So with my canine mini fluffer, I'm never really more than about a third of the way because to me it gets them dry as fast as I'm comfortable with. And typically cats respond really well to it. I almost never turn it all the way up because I just don't need that. No nozzle. I do not use um, the condenser cones on my blow dryers like I would for a lot of dogs. Um, I don't like a lot of nozzles on my dryer hose. I almost entirely use it without. That way the airflow is much bigger, the sound is, is much less, and the, con the air is not so concentrated coming out. Now I sometimes will use a very short water peeler type of nozzle, not the long ones because I just don't have enough room with them, but I use a short one. And I'll use that very limited, um, limitedly. Um, I'll use it for drying legs, so like that really kind of thick um, hair on the legs. Um, but only if the cat is doing really well with it. If the cat is doing really well for the no nozzle, I might try with the water peeler nozzle and see how they do. But sometimes you can almost tell that they're ramping up a little bit because they don't like that additional condensed air. And so in that case, I'll take the nozzle back off and I'll just use it with that. It just takes a little bit longer. Um, next is that you should try to muffle the sounds of the dryer with something like a happy hoodie or a towel wrap. So I've got my happy hoodie right here so this is my table that um i use after the bath it's got all my towels on it and stuff and so i've got the little happy hoodies are great for pretty much all cats even my tiny cats i'll just roll it and use the little one but my big cats will still get these so i keep a whole whole thing of them right there those are fantastic because i want to take you know if i'm using an e-collar and air muzzle during the bath process i want to take it off so i can clean ears and eyes you know if i took it off to clean the head whatever it is and then before I put it back on, I, you know, will kind of towel dry the face and then I'll put the happy hoodie on and then I'll probably put either the e-collar or the air muzzle back on, but that way it's, it's more muffled um, around their ears. And a lot of times I tend to use an e-collar or an air muzzle when I'm drying new cats because I find that one, it also helps with muffling the sound. And this way the air isn't rushing right past their face. So they don't, you know, if they're in the cat, you know, if they're on the table and they turn and the air is right here, they're gonna get really freaked out. So they don't like the air right in their face. So even if I don't think that they're gonna try to bite me, I will still use an e-collar and air muzzle just to help introduce them to the drying process without me having to worry about it. So if they have an, e if they have an air muzzle on, I'm not worried about getting bit and I can dry 99% of their body without them really worrying about it. And then the last little thing I'll do is, you know, take it off and I might be able to take the nozzle off and, and dry around the chin and a little bit on the head. But if they don't like that, then I might just, you know, put them in my cage dryer or I'll put a floor fan on when they're back in their carrier just to help dry around the face a little bit. And to be honest, if they go home with a little bit of a damp face, it's not the end of the world versus damp something else, which could then clump and get matted. Whereas like right around the head, I'm not as concerned about. Um, 
So the next thing I do is I introduce the sounds very slowly and from further away. So when I get them all set up, so they're being bathed, they're wrapped in a towel, they've got a happy hoodie on, they've got an e-collar air muzzle on, then I'll walk over to my dryer in my caddy shack, which is right here, and I'll turn them on and then I'll walk away and I'll hold them and I'll hug them and I'll wrap them like little babies and I can watch them to see their reaction to that loud sound, but I'm not right up next to it, I'm across the room. So that way they can start to hear those loud sounds and it's, it's, they're starting to get acclimated, but they're not right up listening to it. So it's further away, I'm holding them, I'm comforting them and I'm watching them for any changes in their breathing. Um, you know, if they're peeing or pooping, anything like that. I really don't have anybody who does that, you know, knock on wood <laughs> when I'm walking that way, but I can feel if they're tensed up, I can feel if they're relaxing, I can feel if they're trying to wiggle because I've got them right here. Um, and I'm not worried about them, you know, escaping and running around my room and trying to attack me or anything like that. So I've got them in nice. And then we can make our way back over towards the caddy shack and I can sit down, I can open the doors and, and what I'll do is I'll start by unwrapping their back end and I'll start drying like the, a big fat thigh or I'll start by drying the tail. So that way they can feel the air on them without it being right up by their head or right by their legs or you know anything like that so a lot of times i'll start there and i'll start to work my way up because if i have them on my lap or if i'm starting on these back ends those areas typically take the longest to dry and if the cat is laying there they're going to be all hidden from you so if i start by drying the lower belly, the crooks of the back legs, the tail, things like that, then I know that those areas are going to be dry when I when I go to move to something else versus having that be the last thing that I do and the cat might have lost its patience for me by then. So we don't want that. Um, Next is going to be limiting their escape routes. So I've already mentioned my Caddyshack vac and to me, that makes it a no brainer because they have nowhere to go. There's no exit um, for them to run through unless they can get through the armholes. And if they have an e-collar air muzzle on, they can't fit through the armholes. And most of them can't even figure out that there are armholes. So um, I just open the doors, place them in, close the doors, and then I reach in so I can feel them and always have a hand on them when I'm turning the dryer on and when I'm starting to do stuff. And so to me, that makes it a no brainer because there's nowhere for them to go. There's no exits. They can't run off the table. They can't jump down. They can't run at my face. But also the air and all the hair that is being blown off is all gonna be collected in that big bag. So it's not all up in my face and I'm not breathing and picking it out of my eyeballs, gross. Um, if you haven't gotten your caddy shack yet, then you can put your drying table in a corner. So you see how mine, even, even now mine is in a corner. Um, that way you're limiting the how they can get off the table. So they basically either go to the one side where your dryer nozzle is or they go towards you. And at least that's kind of limiting how many places they can go. And they can also smoosh themselves in the corner, you know, where their head's facing that way. And you can dry a lot on the body when their head is facing away from you. So limit escape routes. Um, so the main thing is that you can also incorporate some lap drying or some towel drying or some cage dryer. You know, you can incorporate some other things to help get them drier so that they're much calmer. We want them to be comfortable. The idea isn't to just blast them, you know, and hope for the best. We want to introduce a higher airflow while limiting the noise, while we're using appropriate handling techniques. All this is crucial to keep the cat from getting frightened or agitated. So that wraps up today's episode of Relax, It's Just Cat Grooming. If you have questions or comments, please add them below. If you have a question you'd like me to address in a future episode, you can email me at lynn at nationalcatgroomers.com. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you soon.